YouTube. Hello. Hey there. Hi. How's it going? What is good, YouTube? Oh, man. Welcome to the channel or welcome back to the channel. And may I say, may I say, you are looking absolutely glowing. You are looking just have you done something new with your skincare routine? Because like I said, glowing, you're looking good. You are looking very good. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm I'm coming on to you. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, well, what's going on here? Uh, it's mid-December. It is mid-December, which means, as we all know, game of the year time. I am recording this in mid-December. It is going out mid to late December, if everything goes to plan. Listen, I know you come here for all the hot, odd opinions on video games, because I have the only opinion that matters. So this is the definitive game of the year list. And let me tell you, I tried very hard. I tried very hard getting this down to 10 games. I really did. It didn't happen. It did not happen. Um, so big, big asterisk on the top 10 games of the year because it's a top 10 ish. It's a top 10 ish. I'm not going to not going to spoil how many games are on there. You'll find out in a minute. But, you know, just know it's top 10 ish. It's top 10 ish. But now I'm waffling, so let's let's just get into the video, all right? Um, you can watch the video, form your own opinions, you know, make your comments in the comment box within reason. But, you know, I am a video game expert. Remember that. I am a video game expert, so I'm probably right. You're probably wrong, and that's okay. Uh, nonetheless, though, do feel free to comment, like, subscribe, all that wonderful algorithmy stuff. And um, without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll I'll let me take the proceedings and we'll get into our games of the year. My favorite games. And like I said, the definitive list for the games of the year for 2022. Right. So you're sitting there thinking, why, Ripley, when you've broken the arbitrary rules of arbitrary game of the year lists by not even having 10 official games of the year, do you have an honorable mention list? I mean, like, what is even the point? Why not just include these games into your arbitrary list of games arbitrarily? And you know why? I don't know, to be honest. I just didn't feel right about it. Does that... Does that make sense? There's like a there's a nebulous kind of reason or maybe multiple reasons that add up to make it feel weird to have these games on a conclusive, albeit again, arbitrary list of the best games of the year. So they're not. They're honorable mentions. Essentially, the best explanation I can come up with is this. These games are all rad as hell, but they fall under two categories. Either A, I didn't play enough of them to feel comfortable putting them on a final list of the best games of the year, or they're rad as hell, but they just, for me, have a fundamental flaw, or in some cases, multiple flaws, that held them back from that final, 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 totally final, this is final, underscore, I mean it this time, dot txt, Microsoft Word list that says this is it. So... Let's talk about these games. OK, so I lied. There's also a third category. Games that are simply adorable. And this category is it's one game long. It's paparazzi. Paparazzi is as deep as my subscriber count is large. But a video game about taking pictures of dogs is it's amazing. Simply on premise alone. It's like it's like a dog, in fact. Simple and a little bit stupid and adorable and lovable all at once. Paparazzi is a joy of a few hours, and honestly, I don't need to say much more about it. The premise alone kind of sells itself. It was wonderful to discover this game on Game Pass, live out my fantasy of taking pictures of dogs for a few hours, and then get on with my sad, sad, non-dog picture taking life again. Basically, what I'm saying is just go check out this adorable game and have fun with it. Nothing more really needs to be said. There isn't much to it. You take pictures of dogs, you grin like a doofy idiot, and then that's it. Hey, 
Sifu is the most perfectly cromulent 7.5 out of 10 game of the year, and it's so, so close to being so much more than that. Sifu is an effortlessly cool, stylish Hong Kong cinema-inspired beat-em-up from French developer Slow Clap, the studio behind the equally rad Absolver, and it looked cool as hell when it was revealed in 2021. The unique hook to Sifu, well, there's several. Every time that your character died, you aged, which in turn made you stronger, but it also made you more susceptible to dying, because, you know, getting old means your, your little meat sack of a body becomes more and more fragile. It also featured a leveling up system where you got new abilities that you could be locked out of if you aged too rapidly, because as we all know, humans simply stop learning things by the time you turn 30. Oh, did I also mention that Sifu is a roguelike? Because it's a roguelike. You started each run at the beginning of the game at 20 years old. Or you could skip ahead to subsequent levels that you've unlocked, but if you skipped ahead, you would start those areas at whatever your best age was when you died. So for example, I could skip ahead to Area 3, the museum, but because I suck at the game, it also means that I started Area 3 at like 50 years old. The thing that made Sifu so rad, of course, was its combat. It was fluid as hell, and when you got it right, you felt like a complete badass. It really did look like those old-school Hong Kong action flicks that I grew up on, because Wu-Tang Clan rapped about them. Animations look smooth and fluid, and hits have a crunchy, satisfying weight to them that never gets old. Like, seeing your character go all Bruce Lee on somebody, and then snap their arm or crush their head into a wall, it's immensely satisfying. But the major problem for me at least, it took a lot of stumbling around like an idiot to actually look that cool. This game could be very hard, and even after a patch that eased the difficulty a bit, I never quite found my rhythm with the game, despite really enjoying it. Did the patch help? Yeah, absolutely, but it also came out after I had already had my time with Sifu, and it was really hard to get back into its rhythm. Another thing that I don't want to really hold against the game too much, but I have to mention, it arguably felt a little bit light on features and replayability, and for how expensive it was, I didn't love it. Still though, I really enjoyed my time with Sifu, and I owe it to get back to that game and properly finish it, because it was rad as hell. So, let's talk about Supermassive Games' latest hot 20-somethings, cast as teens, choose em up romp, The Quarry. The Quarry was, for about three quarters of the game, one of my top five games of the year. But then, unfortunately, it had some late game-breaking bugs that just completely soured me on it. And honestly, that's putting it lightly. Wow, I have not soured on a game so hard in quite some time. It's it's not as poo-poo. It's poo-poo. The Quarry was, for about three quarters of the game, one of my top five games of the year, to be honest. But then, unfortunately, it had some really, really bad late game breaking bugs that completely soured me on it. So, what is The Quarry? Well, without spoiling it too much, The Quarry is another super massive game, honestly for better and for worse. If you have played the excellent Until Dawn or the not-so-excellent Dark Pictures trilogy, then you kind of know what you're in for with The Quarry. If you haven't, well, The Quarry is sort of a choose-your-own-adventure-style adventure game with some teen summer camp horror-flavored vibes. It's very much like Until Dawn in that respect, except unlike Until Dawn, The Quarry features werewolves that honestly don't really look like werewolves. And honestly, it also has much better motion capturing and a more likable and well-realized and probably better acted cast. In fact, honestly, that's probably the best thing about The Quarry. It's cast. David Arquette as the camp leader, Hackett, is fantastic in his limited role. Ted Raimi as the weirdo cop dude is also really, really great. And Lynn Shay, the horror icon, probably most famous for her roles as creepy old lady in the Insidious series. She is, she kills it. She's awesome. And props to Lance Hendrickson, the big daddy redneck dude and Grace Zabriskie as the weird, creepy narrator. 
that you find in all of the supermassive games. Seriously, the entire adult cast is amazing. They're great. But the real stars of the show are the 20 somethings that are playing teens. Until Dawn had a likable cast, but my major issue with the game was that everybody played a stereotype. And though I get that that's part of the whole thing about horror media, it also meant that half of the cast were completely unlikable dinguses. I hated them. The Quarry isn't without its stereotypes, I know that, because, you know, it has its horror roots and it knows them well. But it also expertly subverts a lot of your expectations, as all good horror media does. Jacob, played by Zach Tinker, is a perfect example. He is the epitome of a doofus-ass jock who, as the game goes on, you actually begin to like and sympathize with. And Brenda's song as Caitlin and Miles Robbins as Dylan were two other standouts, with Justice Smith, a.k.a. not Ryan Reynolds in Detective Pikachu, also getting a chance to shine as a brooding hot dude, Ryan. And that isn't to undersell the rest of the cast either. They're fantastic. They're all amazing. They're all believable, multi-dimensional characters that were written, acted, and motion captured really, really well. And without those performances being so good, the entire game and honestly, all of Supermassive's whole business model of killing off hot people in increasingly grotesque and horrible ways, it just completely falls apart. And the overarching story of The Quarry, it was rad. It was fun and ridiculous and intriguing until honestly, like, the last hour or so of the roughly 9 to 10 hour runtime. But the problem was those game breaking bugs that honestly literally ruined the game for me. And they all took place within that last hour or so. Without explicitly spoiling anything, I had major characters die because button prompts simply did not register. And that in turn completely undercut an amazing amount of build up and character work throughout the game. Once I finished the game, I looked up the glitches that I was experiencing, and I found out that it was a pretty common occurrence for a lot of people. And even more damning, without the glitches, from what I read online and from what I watched of the quote-unquote good endings for the game, it kind of just fizzles out and ends much sooner than it feels like it ought to. So when you break it down, honestly, even without those glitches, the game's ending still would have felt rushed and unearned. And what makes it all the more depressing is the fact that I played this game in October, and it came out in June. That is nearly five months to fix your arguably game-breaking bugs, and they didn't. And listen, I don't want to come off as too harsh, but don't release your game, especially your narrative-focused game, if there's a bug that literally breaks the narrative. Again, from what I've read, even without those bugs... You could argue that the game still kind of ends on a wet fart. But for me, personally, because of those game-breaking bugs that I experienced, it ends on explosive diarrhea. And I can't name explosive diarrhea as one of my top favorite games of the year. Yay! What a gloriously stupid, brilliant, amazing, ridiculous game trombone champ is. Honestly, what seemed like a meme that would die out in like a week turned out to be a genuinely fun, weird, quirky as hell game in which you slide your mouse up and down, or if you want to get super weird about it, use an actual real life, real trombone to follow note charts a la the Guitar Hero series or Rock Band to, you know, play a trombone. In my case, really, really badly. But what made this game so fun is honestly the community support and the custom songs. Practically anything that your little baby heart can desire, you can find it in Trombone Champ if you look around enough, and the custom songs were super easy to install too. Of course, I can't play a single song for you because of DMCA strikes, but believe me, hearing the stupid off-key doot doot doots of your trombone as you belt it out to Cruel Angel's Thesis or Misery Business or the Wii Shop Channel music, it's amazing. It is, those are some of the best moments in gaming this year. I'm not even lying. I am 100% not being facetious at all. Facetious? Facetious. Faci faci you know what I mean. Anyway, Trombone Champ is this beautiful kind of stupid that I absolutely adore, and I loved my time with it.
Stray, for better and for worse, was marketed as probably more than it honestly ought to have been marketed as. It is a cat game, through and through. You play as a cat, that's about it. It's very simple. You're a cat. Are you an adorable cat? Yeah, absolutely. Do you do platforming that only a cat could do? Yeah, absolutely. Are the cat animations lifelike and meticulous? Absolutely. Is there a meow button that never gets old? Absolutely. And can you be like kind of a nihilistic dickhead that just knocks stuff over for fun because you're a cat? Absolutely. Yes, 1000%. Honestly, Stray is a good game. It is borderline even great. But I think the problem is maybe the internet got a little bit too obsessed with it. Me included. In the throes of the warm fuzzies of Stray, I declared it as, quote, maybe my game of the year. Top three at the very least. That was a lie. <laughs> Weighing Stray against the rest of the really strong year in 2022, it just doesn't quite hold up beyond it just kind of being the cat game. And I'll give Stray credit. It is adorable. Not only is a cat adorable, but the little robot buddy that helps you out throughout your short adventure, also adorable. And like the puzzle platforming, it's really interesting, if not maybe a little bit basic. But I appreciate that all of the puzzle platforming is focused on the fact that you're a cat. You can only get up to and through certain areas because you can leap, you know, like a cat. You can liquefy your body and move through tiny little holes because you're a cat. You knock stuff over, again, like kind of a dingus to reveal certain things and distract robots because you're a cat. Overall, listen, honestly, Stray is rad. It is unique and cool, and I'm glad that it exists. A post-apocalyptic cat platformer, uh, a cat former, if you might. Don't. I hate myself for saying that. It's not something that I ever would have expected to exist, but I'm glad it does. Hey, Tunic is a phenomenal game, I think. Full disclosure, I haven't actually finished tunic yet i haven't played enough to really honestly fully render an opinion on it and that's part of the reason why for me it's an honorable mention at first glance tunic is a link to the past inspired top-down adventure game with a very very cute fox in the titular tunic and the more and more you explore it the more and more you kind of figure out oh this is so much more than that in like a very interesting cool fez-like fashion a little bit of Dark Souls-esque combat and recovering your souls, or whatever they call it, when you die, and a lot of exploring and sussing stuff out, again, a la Fez, and Tunic becomes this fascinating, weird, beautiful, absolutely inscrutable thing. What I really loved about Tunic was its intricately designed, beautifully rendered instruction manual. And yeah, I say that without any irony whatsoever. And maybe part of my love for this game is the fact that I'm old. And I still remember when video games came with instruction manuals and they were an event in and of themselves. They were this cool thing where you bought a video game and then on the ride home in the back of your mom's car, you were just sitting there reading your instruction manual and you were like, yeah, this game's gonna be so cool. But it's not all nostalgia flavored gumdrops and rainbows for Tunic, unfortunately. What I think is its strongest feature is also arguably maybe its biggest flaw it's inscrutability. Tunic, for better and for worse, it does not hold your hands. What I loved so much about Tunic was the fact that you simply wake up on the beach as your furry little fox friend, you look through the instruction manual, you explore, and then you stumble around until you have your aha moments. The problem for me, though, I kind of stumbled around a little bit too much, and that stumbling really undercut a lot of those aha moments. And you know, I will fully admit, this part of the game, completely subjective. People who are more in tune with what the game expects of you, they won't stumble around as much as I did, but this is my list after all, not anybody else's. The perfect distillation of what I'm talking about, I legitimately wandered around aimlessly for like 45 minutes until I found a tiny, tiny little gap that I had to shimmy through to progress to the next part of the game. And honestly, that sucked out loud. There was no way around it. It ground my progress and enjoyment to a literal standstill, and the game didn't have any kind of breadcrumb... Breadcrumb? 
breadcrumb, breadcrumb trail to even hint where I needed to go next. It was it was tedious and it was annoying. And when I finally discovered the little gap, it wasn't this huge revelatory aha moment. It was just kind of a moment of like, well, that sucked. That was a waste of time. That was infuriating. I am so glad that that is over. And then, like an hour or two later, I was just stuck again. Listen, I don't need to be told immediately what to do next for a puzzle the second that I am prompted with said puzzle. Think you can uncover that geyser from here? <laughs> oh, I think I get it. If you freeze the geyser, the pressure will turn the wheel. But eventually, some kind of like even a little even a little tiny gentle nudge in the right direction it would go a long way listen i know that tunic is great and in a way i feel like i failed it i feel like i am a big dummy considering how much universal praise has been justifiably put upon it but unfortunately the start stop rhythm of tunic it just put me off enough that i didn't feel incentivized to go back to the game beyond this like worryingly deep sense of guilt that I was missing out on something great. And, you know, maybe I am, but I just I couldn't bring myself to get back to Tunic as much as I wanted to. And I wanted to like it more than I did. And in the end, unfortunately, that's why Tunic for me is just an honorable mention. Right. So Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the Cowabunga collection, for me, is an honorable mention because it feels kind of weird to celebrate a collection of 8-bit and 16-bit video games released throughout the 1980s and 90s and give them a place on a list of games that were released in 2022. But to be fair to the team at Digital Eclipse, the Cowabunga collection is honestly an unrivaled, immaculate homage to a pivotal time in gaming and in my life, so... I have to give it props. Digital Eclipse is arguably the best in the game when it comes to archival video game collections. If you haven't checked out their Disney Afternoon collection, for example, or their crowning achievement, Atari 50, the anniversary celebration, you ought to. They are amazing. When it comes to the preservation of and the celebration of old video games, seriously, Digital Eclipse is on a whole other level. Atari 50 is called the anniversary celebration for a reason, after all. Digital Eclipse does painstaking, mind-blowing work in not just preserving old games, but going the extra bajillion miles to celebrate old games with amazing behind-the-scenes, feature-length documentaries, old press and archival footage, and so on. Seriously, it is staggeringly good, and for the Cowabunga Collection, though their archival footage isn't as extensive as Atari 50, it is still amazing. And I admittedly, I got a soft spot for the Ninja Turtles. I was too young to be an Atari kid, but I grew up right in the heyday of Turtle Fever. And Turtles in Time, it is one of my favorite games ever. So this collection, a smorgasbord of 8 and 16-bit games of admittedly varying quality, was undoubtedly for me and other 30 to 40-somethings wanting a hit of that sweet, sweet heroes in a half-shell nostalgia. It also has a plethora of enhancements like Rewind and Safe States, screen size options, and these like weird, maybe deliberately bad LCD filters, and things like the boss characters for tournament fighters being unlocked, as well as different versions of the games, like say, Return of the Shredder on the Genesis slash the Mega Drive for Japan, compared to the Hyperstone Heist in North America, and so on and so forth. That said, did they do much beyond those enhancements and admittedly the very rad option to play online? No. No, they didn't. But like, they didn't really need to when you think about it. Where the Cowabunga collection stands out, like all Digital Eclipse games, is the archival footage and the dedication to preserving these games. Again, is it as extensive as Atari 50? No, it isn't. But like, I imagine a lot of that has to do with the fact that licensing is a nightmare, but it still has a buttload of archival footage and it's still the best way to revel in an era of gaming and honestly, an air of my childhood that I loved. Am I slightly biased in the sense that, like, Ninja Turtles is basically just my favorite thing full stop ever? 
100% yes, I fully admit I am. But still, Cowabunga Collection is, it's a rad thing to just exist at all. And it is a rad tribute to a rad time, not only in gaming, but in my childhood. And I want to commend it for not only just being this amazing archival piece, but I want to commend Digital Eclipse in hopes that they keep doing what they're doing and putting out incredible collections to ensure that video game history just keeps getting preserved in the right way. Hooray, Need for Speed Unbound is probably the most shocking game of the year for me. And honestly, it's not even all that amazing. Like, from what I've played of it, which is about six or seven hours, it's just really solid. It's like a, it's like a seven and a half, eight out of ten game. But for a recent Need for Speed game, that is near miraculous. I think a lot of the reasoning behind me liking Need for Speed Unbound is the circumstances around its release. I got Callisto Protocol like a big dumb idiot because Dead Space 1, it's one of my favorite games of all time. But I was profoundly disappointed by Callisto Protocol, and then I was lucky enough to be able to basically exchange it outright rather than get like $30 of trading credit for it. So I perused my local GameStop, sifting through the shelves upon shelves upon shelves of Funko Pops to actually find some video games. And I settled upon Need for Speed Unbound because, like, I didn't know what else to grab and I'd heard pretty good things about it. And I can't really explain it, but for some reason, these two completely unrelated games now share this weird, special bond for me. I can't think of one without thinking of the other, and their trajectories from pre-release to actually being out in the world for people to buy and to play, for me, it's fascinating. Seriously, if you had on your 2022 bingo card when trailers for these two games got released, that Callisto Protocol would be kind of mediocre and Need for Speed would be good? You're a flat-out liar. But that's exactly what happened. Callisto Protocol is this rote, by-the-numbers, boring, like, mediocre at best, broken at worst game, and Need for Speed Unbound is like, actually good. And maybe part of the reason that I want to celebrate this game is because I want to cheer for the little guy. You know, the little guy developed and published by the multi-million dollar video game giant known as EA. For real though, EA basically put this game out to pasture the second that it was released. They revealed Need for Speed Unbound in early October and released it on December 2nd. This year. That is not even two months of hype for the game. And it's also, as of this recording in mid-December, plummeted in price. It started out as an $89.99 Canadian game, and not even two weeks later, it is $49.99. That is pants on head bonkers. And it's a good game. Like seriously, it, it's a good game. Honestly, consider picking it up. It's 50 bucks. It's like 10 bucks American probably. You could probably get it for free if you really waited for another week. The characters, they're not amazing by any means, and the story so far, it's very by the numbers. But I will give the game credit. It has a story. Just full stop, it has a story. Like, that in and of itself, kind of amazing. And I'll give the game credit for featuring a diverse cast, which is relatively well acted and relatively charming, even if ooh, sometimes the dialogue very much gives off the vibe of, like, a middle-aged man in a suit trying to approximate what young people sound like and kind of failing miserably. I also very much like, as a non-binary friendo, the option for your character to look however you want them to look and to wear whatever you want them to wear. And also, Need for Speed Unbound has this really dope artistic vision that I admit doesn't fully work, but it still looks really, really good. All of the characters are cell shaded looking like they're almost kind of ripped from this, like, obscure cult classic action game from the 360 era that you don't remember. But I mean that in the best way, and it's this really unique look that I like a lot. And then the cars, they they look like they're from a game released in 2022. You know, like the wheels are round, they're round as hell, and like the headlights, they're they're headlighty, and I don't know, they look like cars, you know, except here's the thing, they've got flair. Okay, for example, when you drift or you boost or you kind of nearly do literally anything in the game. The tires come alive with these really dope looking plumes of graffiti inspired smoke or neon streaked lines trail your car as it zips through the busy streets at a really steady, solid 60 frames a second. 
and like, is this game mind-blowingly good looking? No, but I appreciate that it went for a bold, striking look, and the PS5 version of the game, for me, it looks really, really good on a 4K monitor. Need for Speed Unbound is rich, vibrant, and honestly, just as importantly as well, the driving feels really good. It has got the standard kind of floaty, but like solid feeling driving model that Need for Speed has had for quite a while, but even better, to be honest. And the AI is tough without feeling cheap. Honestly, in a weird way, Need for Speed is the Auto Modelista sequel that I never knew that I wanted. Which is not a sentence that I would have expected to say in 2022, because it's 2022, and who is thinking about Auto Modelista? Could it have gone a little bit further with the whole striking as hell visual style? Yeah, absolutely. And I wish it did. But I also kind of love its weird mishmash of art styles. Honestly, it is 2022, and I never expect there to be another good Need for Speed game. Legit, I really never expect there to be another good one. And Need for Speed Unbound, it's better than good. It is, it's great. It is fantastic. And like, it's 50 bucks. Or, or like I said, give it another week and they'll probably just give it away to you for free, to be honest. So go check it out. It's rad. Generation 9, aka Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, for me, an admittedly casual fan who sometimes forgets typing matchups, but is not one of those dinguses that thinks only the original 150 designs were good and anything after them sucks, it's probably the best generation ever. Or, more accurately, it should be. Oh, it should be. Not since Pokemon Gold and Silver, or their near-perfect remakes, Heart Gold and Soul Silver, have I enjoyed a Pokemon game like I have enjoyed Pokemon Violet. But there's this, like, ginormous Waylord-sized... Waylord in the room that we need to address. Pokemon Scarlet and Pokemon Violet are tragically, tragically, tragically busted. As of recording in mid-December, and after an acknowledgement of the rocky launch and the issues plaguing these two games, as well as not only a day one patch, but another patch to, quote, address issues, these games are still busted. Like, legit, in my 30-something years of playing video games, I cannot think of a major video game release by a major publisher that is more janky and broken than Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. And yet, as of recording... I put like nearly a hundred hours into the game. This game is, this game is fantastic. This game is amazing when it works. Before I ramble about the myriad technical issues that riddle these two games, I want to lavish some actual praise upon Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. First off, I love, I love, love, love that it is laughably easy to shiny hunt Pokemon in these two games. Combine the power of the Masuda Method dittos, exploiting the hell out of mass outbreaks and isolated encounters, and finally, how gloriously overpowered making sandwiches is, which is a really weird sentence now that I say it out loud, and shiny hunting is genuinely fun in these games. Like, it's got me going down YouTube rabbit holes and not hating myself for it. Up until Scarlet and Violet, I'd only ever caught maybe one or two shinies before ever, and in Scarlet and Violet, because of the open world nature of the game, and because of all the stuff I mentioned before, and just the absurd amount of Pokemon that you see, I've had like four shinies within two days of playing the game. And this was before I even started to try and hunt down shiny Pokemon. Now that I've actually beat the game, I'm having a lot of fun just kind of like messing around, booting up the game, and in some cases, studying the like basically imperceptible differences between normal and shiny variants of Pokemon while I just like watch YouTube videos or Twitch or something in the background. And it's it's just a kind of a great way to just zone out and relax with the game. Also, especially after a relatively weak Generation 8 with Pokemon Sword and Shield, Scarlet and Violet introduce some awesome new Pokemon designs, and I generally enjoy the whole vibe that they've got going on with the whole weird past and future versions of established Pokemon. 
even if admittedly it's kind of lame that every single future version of a Pokemon is just, hey, we made this Pokemon like iron and called it iron something. A little bit lazy. It's a little bit lazy, but still designs overall really cool. And sticking with the criticisms of Sword and Shield, one thing that for me just made it so meh was the fact that like it didn't really have a post game. You beat it and then that was it. But meanwhile, Scarlet and Violet not only are better by default simply for having a post game at all, but they like actually have a good one. They have a meaty, solid post game where you can go back and you can challenge the gym leaders in their final forms. And, you know, they have, like I said, a fun and engaging shiny hunt if you want to get into that. And you also got to fight against Team Star, who are a merry band of students who are fighting against bullying in their own weird way. And although, honestly, the actual gameplay mechanics of the Team Star battles were a little bit tedious and probably the weakest part of the game's story, the fact that the Team Star sections even had a story at all, let alone a halfway decent one with pathos and empathy for the quote-unquote antagonists of the game, it's it's really commendable for a Pokemon game. Like, that's kind of... that's what Terastalizing is also really, really cool. What is terrestrializing, by the way, other than a really awkward word? Well, basically, it's a new mechanic introduced in Scarlet and Violet in which certain Pokemon that you encounter in raid battles or as one-off encounters in the wild can completely change your typing, leading to really interesting and cool new ways to build and revitalize certain Pokemon. Multiplayer is also mostly seamless, by the way, and fun. Nintendo kinda actually did multiplayer right, which is shocking, because it's Nintendo. In Scarlet and Violet, you essentially join a multiplayer lobby and can just hang out doing your own thing with your friends as well as host and join raids and kind of almost maybe sometimes actually see what your friends are doing in the world. Is it perfect? No, absolutely not. Don't forget, this is a Nintendo game after all, but credit where credit is due. Mostly, the multiplayer works and mostly it is really fun. I also very much love the fact that not only did you get to fight gym leaders, but you also fought these big, doofy quote-unquote Titan Pokemon that gave your chosen ride Pokemon, either Maridon or Coridon, dope abilities that made getting around the world of Paldea, like, good and much easier. But here's a double-edged sword of those abilities, which kind of dovetails into my criticisms of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. The second that you get the ability to glide in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, you really, really see just how downright janky and awful this game looks like, listen, I know that I can be a little bit hyperbolic sometimes, but legit Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, they look worse than a 360 or PS3 era game most of the time. Like they, they might look even as bad as like some GameCube and PS2 and Xbox era games. Like they are, they are, they are bad. Like, Ooh, they oh they're so bad. Like, listen, mostly the Pokemon they look, they look fine. They look good for the most part, ish, kind of. Like, the shiny bits are shiny, and there's a hint of textured fur that you can kind of make out on the furry Pokemon that I wish looked better, but, like, overall, they look good. But, dear God, the textures, the textures in the game are just so apocalyptically flat and muddy and downright bad. And then you get to the jank, like... Sometimes, sometimes entire, entire Pokemon centers or cliffs or Pokemon themselves will just literally disappear. Like Pokemon will, will disappear and clip through mountains and walls. Like Pokemon people and objects alike that are quote unquote in the far off distance of like five, 10, maybe 20 feet away. They'll just legitimately animate with two frames of animation. And it is 2022. Like, I don't get this. Like, you'll be in a battle and the camera will just lose its goddamn mind and not frame things properly. And it doesn't make sense. Like, it is horrendous. It is, listen, it is hilarious sometimes. But also, this is a full price game put out by Game Freak and Nintendo and the Pokemon Company. And I know, listen, I know that these games were released on painfully old, painfully underpowered hardware on the Nintendo Switch. But still, these are full price games. This is inexcusable. It is ridiculous. The technical issues aren't just limited to the bad textures and the bad lighting and the pop in. 
and just just how downright bad and janky the game looks. It's more than that. It's also the multiplayer. If you're just joining a lobby with your friends, like I said, you're fine ish for the most part, but it starts to fall apart when you want to get involved in the online raid battles that were introduced in Sword and Shield, popularized in Pokemon Go, and then return in Violet and Scarlet. Jank rears its ugly, janky head in the raid battles with constant disconnects and lag spikes that make it really hard to tell what's going on in the raid battles, which, like, really sucks considering the fact that raid battles have a time limit and you could legit lose half of your time to lag and then spend another couple of minutes trying to fruitlessly connect to another raid battle. And when you're incentivized to actually play the raid battles for special, time-limited, and powerful Pokémon, experience points, and late game materials and items, then they don't actually work all that well. It kind of sucks. Legit, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet could easily be the best Pokemon games ever released, like 9 out of 10 or 10 out of 10 games. But the jank of it all just, it holds those games back so much. And it makes them like 5 out of 10, 6 out of 10 games at best. But I'm a genetic freak and I'm not normal. So you got a 25% at best at beating me. And then you add Kurt Angle to the mix, your chances of winning drastically go down. Somehow, bafflingly, have played way, way, way too much of, and for some weird reason, thoroughly enjoy, despite all of the jank. But because of all that jank that just like piles itself on top of such a fundamentally rad game and pushes all the radness way, way down, I can't put Pokemon Scarlet and Violet any higher on my game of the year list than number 12. Because it's it's broken. Oh, it's so broken. Yay! Neon White is probably the most purely fun game on this list of very fun games. Seriously, it just undoubtedly has the best feel out of not only any game this year, but probably any game in the last couple of years. This run-based half-platformer, half-shooter is so beautifully, meticulously constructed, and when you're playing it, well, honestly, there's nothing like it on this list. I find myself, even in my limited gaming abilities, always gravitating towards at least one, like, flow state game a year. And this year, that's Neon White. I mean, I feel like if you're watching this video and you play video games, you know what I mean, but if you don't, I mean a game where everything just kind of clicks and you don't even have to think about what you're doing, whilst just absolute madness unfolds on the screen. Like, you know, the Devil May Cry's on the hardest difficulties, or the Kaizo Mario runs, or Doom, or Hotline Miami, or Tetris, something like that. And what makes Neon White so impressive is how it so effortlessly empowers, incentivizes, and teaches players. Your first run on a level, it's, it's all about learning. You tentatively start the level, hone in on the finish, and then you just kind of flail about until you reach the end. You look at the par time, and then you go, how the hell do you get that time? How? And then, as you earn medals, and you get hints for shortcuts, and you get images of ghosts that help guide you, you feel like a genius when you pull off something amazingly cool, and you shave, like, legitimately, 20 seconds, 30 seconds off of your par time when you did not think that was possible before. And then you keep doing it. You keep doing it over and over and over and over again just to shave like 0 0.0001 seconds off of your runtime. And this all works because it's got the Tony Hawk thing down. And no, I don't mean being recognized in public and people asking you if you're Tony Hawk. What I mean is you press restart and then the level restarts in like literally half a second. Basically, if you had to wait for this game, it, it wouldn't work. Neon White is all about momentum, and that carries over into every aspect of the game. Which is why it's kind of weird that momentum grinds to a halt with cutscenes. Yeah, this game has cutscenes, it has a story, it has a largely ignorable story, luckily, but it has a story nonetheless, and the story bits are kind of the worst part of the game. Most of the characters are honestly absolute dinguses, and I just kind of want them to stop talking so that I can run and I can shoot more. And can I skip the cutscenes? Yeah, I absolutely can. But it just feels like an unnecessary distraction, and it's weird. 
Luckily enough, though, I can run and I can shoot a lot, and the story bits, they really don't detract too much from this excellent, excellent game. Another note on this game that I cannot think of how to exactly work into this mini review without it being an awkward little segue, but we're going to make it an awkward little segue, is the fact that I wish I had more friends. No, for real, none of my gaming friends uh, have played this game. Not a single one. And I know that I would have got so much more enjoyment out of Neon White and time out of it had I actually been competing against friends on the leaderboards. But I was just competing against myself. And like, listen, playing with yourself is fun, but playing with friends, it's better. Overall, though, Neon White is a blisteringly fast, beautiful, striking, fun game that just feels so damned good to play. And undoubtedly, it is one of the best games of the year. Last year, I didn't have much to say about Monster Hunter Rise, because honestly, I'm kind of a filthy casual, and I was mostly along for the ride with friends who actually understood the game much, much better than I did. And that remains the exact same for the DLC Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak. Everything that made Rise so good, the ability to zippity doodah all the live long day like Spider-Man, with a big off size sword made out of a dragon skull attached to your back and a diverse set of weapons and armor with way too many skills and abilities to master that allows for nearly unlimited ways to play the game and it all looks buttery smooth on the pc all that is still here seriously the re engine sings on pc like legit this game looks great and runs great on practically any pc you can think of is everything in sunbreak amazing though no, unfortunately not. Sunbreak introduces a new system of upgrading weapons and armor revolved around materials that feels honestly more arbitrarily grindy than the base game did. And there's also a system for upgrading your jewelry and abilities that just sucks. You basically just throw materials away and hope for the best. It's, it's like a pachinko game, and like a pachinko game, you often end up wildly disappointed. All that said, I still had hours upon hours of fun flailing around like an idiot using my insect glaive, getting carried by much, much more competent friends in Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak. The act of busting up the skulls, the tails, the wings, and other various body parts of ginormous monsters is, and always has been, immensely fun in this series. And in Sunbreak, it's as fun as it has ever been. But, also... Sunbreak is very iterative, and I kind of just found myself being more excited and coming back to other games on this list. Either way, though, Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak is still incredible, and if my friends told me right now to just drop everything because they wanted to grind for like 10 hours, 20 hours even, to finish their meta DPS Dual Blades build, and I hate myself for knowing what that means, honestly, I would do it in a heartbeat. If there was an award for the neatest game of the year, Cult of the Lamb would undoubtedly win it. And if there was an award for the best Twitch integration of the year, Cult of the Lamb would win that too. Honestly, Cult of the Lamb probably has the best Twitch integration that I have ever seen in any video game ever. Cult of the Lamb is rad as hell. The part roguelike, part farming, mostly people managing game combines all three genres mostly successfully, and it looks really, really amazing doing it. Seriously, I adore this game's cutesy slash macabre look, but I also think that the game's aesthetic might be its biggest downfall. For me, Cult of the Lamb is at its best when you're interacting with your cultists, a ragtag collection of adorable little fuzzy, scaly, demonic little ding-dongs who apparently do not know how to A- do any kind of work whatsoever. B. Use toilets correctly. C. Not look at dead bodies. Or D. Stop themselves from continuing to look at the dead bodies and then throwing up everywhere. What do I do with this dead body? What do I do with it? Don't look at it. Stop looking at the goddamn dead body, you idiots. Listen, all of the cultists are completely moronic. And for that, in their own way, I love them, as infuriating as they can sometimes be. And though you can play Cult of the Lamb without Twitch integration, which is the case on consoles, 
I honestly cannot imagine doing so. There was something gleeful and fun and inventive and rad about putting up with a kind of so-so eh combat, getting a villager, then running back to my home base to fire up a randomized ballot and have a member of my Twitch community customize their little weirdo for me to basically just berate and yell at because they're a moron. Again, I think the Twitch integration is so inventive, unique, and cool, and it is easily the best part of Call to the Lamb. For me, though, where the game starts to falter is, like I said, in the actual playing of it. The people slash cult management and the farming aspects of the game, you optimize your farm layout and you gather your resources as best you can, and you pay close attention to what everybody wants and everybody desires, and you do that on a loop over and over and over again. And as time goes on, you eventually better optimize and automate your cult and your farm, and you're good. You're golden. Then, though, you get to the roguelike parts of the game. You get to the combat. The combat is at best good, but at worst, it's it's just kind of tedious and clunky. Cult of the Lamb, to me, plays like a looser feeling Binding of Isaac. And for some reason, I just could never quite get a feeling for it. The weapons just kind of lacked the sense of weightiness to them, and the timing on the dodge roll was... It just felt awkward. Most annoyingly, though, what put me off of the game, and ultimately dropped the game down the list quite a lot, was the readability of the combat. Through a combination of the camera just maybe being a little bit too far pulled back, and the enemies and the titular lamb blending a little bit too much into the foreground and the background sometimes, encounters just kind of devolved into a guessing game of when and where and how you were getting hit and hitting things back, and you could just kind of end up losing health or even honestly your entire run without really understanding why. Now, did it ruin the game? No, absolutely not. I still had a lot of fun with Call to the Lamb, and the combat never really felt downright hard or infuriating, but I'll admit it was just off-putting enough that sometimes I found myself just kind of being like, mm -hmm. This is just a little bit too much of a slog, and I didn't really want to keep going with it. I just didn't exactly feel propelled. Overall, though, Cult of the Lamb is still a phenomenal, unique, adorable, and inventive game that, honestly, everybody ought to check out. In a weird way, I kind of don't want to reward NBA 2K23, because, honestly, it is one of the most egregious offenders of one of gaming's biggest issues, microtransactions. In our late-stage capitalistic hellscape known as modern video games, in the wrong hands of the wrong developers and the wrong publishing team, microtransactions downright suck. They're predatory and they're gross and they're honestly, they're potentially life-ruining. Just full stop. On top of the already ludicrously expensive $90 Canadian just to buy the base game, you could potentially spend hundreds of dollars to get the best players in the ultimate team like my team mode, and at least like 50 bucks if not more to make yourself competitive in the online my park mode where you team up and take on other players. Sure, you could grind in single player games and bring your character over to the online mode, but rewards in single player games and honestly, even in online games, they're so paltry that NBA 2K23 essentially forces you to pay real-life money to get good and actually be on the level of other players. And yet, I love NBA 2K23. Why? Because I haven't engaged with any of this stuff or played any online in NBA 2K23 whatsoever. In fact, I barely even play the game at all. I spent about 99% of my time in NBA 2K23 and it's mind-blowing, engrossing, best-in-class franchise mode known as the Eras Mode. Introduced this year, NBA 2K23 has basically made, undoubtedly in my opinion at least, the best franchise mode in a sports game ever. Like, legit, ever. It puts any other franchise mode to shame and makes me reconsider what I want franchise modes in sports games to look like moving forward. Essentially, you can start in Eras Mode all the way back in the 1983-1984 season, known as the Magic vs. Bird era, and rewrite history with Michael Jordan and countless others joining new teams via drafts, free agency, trades, and so on. You can play the games, you can simulate, you can mix and match, all the way up to the modern era and beyond. You can start in Eras Mode in 91-92, aka the Jordan era, and see if you can somehow best the already best in the world two-time three-peating Chicago Bulls. You can also start in 2001-2002, aka the Kobe era, and see where LeBron and friends get drafted, 
You could start in the modern era. You can simply play through every era and watch how the league and the game and the stars evolve starting all the way back in 1983-84. And listen, other games have done this type of thing before. For example, the Out of the Park baseball games, as well as Franchise Hockey Manager, they both have historical and fictional leagues that you can set up. And other games have had historical teams, including NBA 2K. But what makes the era's mode so mind-blowingly impressive is the attention to detail. Does it get everything right? No. No, it doesn't. And honestly, for good reason. That would be a logistical nightmare when it comes to licensing. But does it get so, so much right? Absolutely it does. Seriously, it is bonkers. Eras have appropriate broadcast packages and play styles. Teams have appropriate era uniforms and arenas. And more than that, it features goddamn branding in said arenas that is era appropriate. It is an absolute trip watching a game in, say, 1986 between the Atlanta Hawks and the, the Philadelphia 76ers. And it looks deliberately bad because of this amazing grainy CRT filter and you're squinting your eyes and then just out of the corner of your eye, you see an era appropriate Mountain Dew logo in the stands and it's mind blowing. Like it is it is so cool. And there's changes like relocations and league expansion. All that stuff takes place when it ought to. And here's another thing, too. You have the power to change or not change history as you see fit. Do you want to make sure that the Clippers never move to L.A. or the Sonics never move to Oklahoma City or the Grizzlies to Memphis? You can do that stuff. And what has made this mode even better? 2K is embracing its community. Now, come mid-December, whatever little foibles that the game had with historical inaccuracies, they're mostly fixed due to a rich, ever-evolving community creation scene that sees people putting out accurate rosters, accurate draft classes, creative players, uniforms, arenas, and everything else. And the other thing too, all this stuff is easily searchable and downloadable and customizable. It is amazing. It's fascinating to just set up a universe and watch it play out. Even if you just have a passing interest in basketball. And honestly, even if you don't, I'd consider checking out the Ares mode anyway, especially if you can get 2K23 for cheap. It's this fascinating, addictive game mode that hopefully will get even better in subsequent years, and you don't even have to play a single minute of the game to enjoy it. So you combine the Ares mode with this really fun, scary, comprehensive, interactive career retrospective on Michael Jordan, and a more robust and fully featured WNBA mode, gameplay improvements, and new shoes. And honestly, NBA 2K23, it is probably the best NBA 2K in a long, long time, if not maybe ever. And legit, it sets new standards for what sports games ought to be going forward. There's a lot of Ninja Turtles on my Game of the Year list between the Cowabunga Collection and this game, published by .mu, who are behind the absolutely amazing Streets of Rage 4 and developed by Tribute Games, who put out the criminally underrated grapple hook platformer Flint Hook in 2017. And when I saw the trailer for this game, it instantly became my most anticipated game of 2022. All that said, that was a lot of pressure for Shredder's Revenge to live up to. And yet, it more than lived up to it. It crushed it. Shredder's Revenge is everything that you would want from a fresh, modern revitalization of a Turtles-flavored brawler. The roster is solid, featuring the Turtles, Casey Jones, Splinter, and for me, the most fun character to use, April. Alongside a roster of baddies to bop over the head that are both obscure as hell and iconic as hell in equal measure. It controls amazingly well and the characters all have unique, dope-looking movesets. It has seamless multiplayer between Game Pass and Steam no less, which is sadly rare, and it just oozes, pun intended, with charm and a sort of effortless joy that is absolutely infectious. Seriously, Shredder's Revenge is just an absolute feast for the eye, thanks not only to its beautiful, chunky sprite work, but its meticulous eye for detail that you can't help but be mesmerized by. Everything pops in this beautiful, vibrant way that makes the game so, so rad to look at, and the more that you look at it, the more you discover and appreciate all of the amazing little touches that went into the game. You can tell that Shredder's Revenge was a labor of love, and it shows in every single pixel on the screen. My biggest complaint about the game, though? Admittedly, it was a little bit on the short side, and though there's definite replayability in leveling up characters and getting new abilities, or playing the game on harder modes and unlocking new characters, as well as playing the game with different configurations of friends, 
Honestly, after a handful of hours, you've kind of seen everything that the game has to offer. Still, these are minor nitpicks against what overall, for me at least, is one of the most charming, fun, and satisfying brawlers that I have played in years. Which is saying a lot considering how stacked the revitalized brawler scene is these days. But Shredder's Revenge is that good. Shredder's Revenge is rad as hell, and I love it. Honestly, Vampire Survivors is probably the number one game of the year, and only cowards wouldn't name Vampire Survivors the number one game of the year. Vampire Survivors is the ultimate power fantasy game. If you have ever wondered what it's like to be a mediocre white man, then Vampire Survivors is the game for you. You move around, not really doing much, to be honest. Life just kind of happens around you, and you somehow keep winning and getting ahead despite your complete lack of doing anything beyond simply existing. Seriously, I love Vampire Survivors. This roguelike walk around em up is so beautifully simple. Like, you don't even attack in this game. The game just does it for you, with attacks being on different cooldowns. All you have to worry about is moving. The more and more enemies that you kill, the more upgrades you get, making you that much more powerful, ultimately allowing for you to just completely clear the screen and kill literal hundreds of enemies in this pixelated kaleidoscope of death and chaos. The game has a buttload of hidden depth, too, which is what makes it a Game of the Year contender. The more and more that you actually play Vampire Survivors, the more and more you learn how to break it and optimize it, and that's when it really gets fun. Vampire Survivors is just so easy to boot up and get your dopamine hit for like 15 or 20 minutes, as the screen just eventually fills with like a bajillion enemies and you plow your way through them as this little pixelated equivalent of a nuclear weapon with totally not Castlevania, but definitely Castlevania music thrumming in the background. Vampire Survivors is the perfect game to play right now as you're typing out this script. It is the perfect game to keep open and just play through the entire day when you have like 5 or 10 or 15 free minutes. What I also love about Vampire Survivors is that its developers were not afraid to constantly iterate on it, to constantly throw things out that didn't work and tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak until they basically reach perfection, and then tweak it some more. And then they put out this game for legitimately less than the price of a sandwich. And as good as a sandwich is, Vampire Survivors is better. Honestly, it might even be as good as two sandwiches. The Mortuary Assistant is a game about you, Rebecca, the titular Mortuary Assistant, who works for Raymond Delver, aka We've got Cillian Murphy at home, and within like 10 minutes to a half an hour, depending on how much you actually stall for time because you're terrified, things really start to go awry at the mortuary, and you're left alone to deal with not only a bunch of corpses, but your own rapidly deteriorating sanity brought upon due to a straight-up possession. And listen, many, many games by this year of our lore, 2022, have dealt with mental health and rapidly deteriorating sanity to varying degrees of success. The Mortuary Assistant is the first game, at least that I know of personally, to deal with possession though. And if it isn't, it's a first to deal with it so, so well. Horror game tropes like disembodied voices and weird shadows take on this whole new spine-chilling dimension to them when you realize that your character is progressively getting more and more possessed, and there isn't much you can do about it other than simply your job. And that's something else I love about this game. There's a strange, hypnotic, honestly morbid tedium to the routine of embalming bodies that helps ground not only Rebecca, the character, but you, the player. You need the monotony of cutting open bodies and jamming weird tubes in them to settle your frayed nerves after you swear, for the tenth time, that you have definitely seen a shadow at the edges of your periphery. I played this game in a sort of fever dream state during my 24-hour charity stream this year, from start to finish, in one sitting. And I'm sure that that definitely influences my love of it. I, I'm aware of that. Everything about this game, though, was heightened. From my sheer terror and dread just being steeped in the game's world, to the amazing heights of guessing which body that the demon had possessed, and getting the best ending that I could. I came back to the game, and whilst I couldn't match that first playthrough delirium, I still had so much fun with the game on subsequent playthroughs, as pants browningly scared as I was playing it. In you go. Methanol. In you go. Uh, where was the other? <laughs> Humic taunt or whatever. Oh, f you! Oh my f god! Oh my f hmm. Hmm. What the f 
Oh, oh, f you. Oh, my f God. What in the f Ah! This game is just so inventive and unique and cool, and again, terrifying. Its genius is in its execution. It borrows roguelike randomization and it scares, meaning that even though major beats will play out similarly, there's a guarantee that no two playthroughs are going to be the exact same, and you will still be getting scared in new, weird, inventive, and unsettling ways for hours upon hours. Seriously, I adored and hated and respected the hell out of the Mortuary Assistant, and I genuinely think that it is one of the most inventive, unique, and fascinating horror games to be released in a long, long time. Citizen Sleeper is honestly one of the best pieces of cyberpunk media that I have ever consumed. It is a breathtaking, beautiful, interesting, intriguing piece of art. Like, it, oh, it rips. It is so good. So what is Citizen Sleeper? Well, it's a narrative-focused RPG that features a really inventive, cool dice system inspired by tabletop gaming with legitimately... Some most staggeringly beautiful character art that I've ever seen, illustrated by author and illustrator Guillaume Singelin. Basically, you wake up one day as a sleeper, a sort of human consciousness in a robot's body, on this place called Erlen's Eye, an unfathomably large, mostly derelict old space station that houses literal thousands upon thousands of people at the edge of space. Once you wake up, you spend what they call cycles, or what I intuited as days, navigating the dingy back alleys and the neon skyscrapers of Erlen's Eye, meeting this unforgettable cast of characters along your way. Each cycle, you wake up, you roll your dice, and you hope for the best. Your dice, which can be affected by character upgrades, then modify rolls for better and for worse, and those dice rolls can then influence simple, repeatable things like, say, working at a bar, or one-off things with dire consequences that can completely change not only your entire playthrough, but your entire understanding of the world around you. Outside of the gorgeous character art, most of the world building in Citizen Sleeper is done through text. If this game were written poorly, it would simply fall apart. But it isn't. Honestly, Citizen Sleeper might be the most well-written game that I have ever experienced. And I might have my biases because I'm a big old nerdy nerd that loves nerdy books, but seriously, this game world is an absolute delight to simply experience and, and be enraptured by because the prose and the character dialogue is that damned good. Like, there were multiple times where I simply just sat back and exclaimed out loud, oh my god, that passage is so beautiful. And it's the writing that does so much to give you such a vivid sense of place and does so much to help construct this staggeringly complex, beautiful, broken, amazing world. Unfortunately, though, the game isn't without its flaws. Arguably, for me at least, the game is maybe a little bit too open-ended, and it can drag at times. I thought for sure that I was towards the end of the game on multiple occasions, only for me to open up completely new paths and new sub-stories that went on for multiple hours. And the UI, it could maybe use a little bit of tweaking, especially when it comes to making it more obvious to the player when they're about to roll the dice for an action that can't be repeated and could have those dire consequences I talked about earlier. Even a simple tweak like making the big boy choices, the ones that really matter, say, a different color than the inconsequential ones, that would go a long way to solving some of my frustrations that are, you know, by no means ruinous, but they add up to disappoint a little bit. All in all, though, legit, Citizen Sleeper is a masterpiece. It is a staggering, beautiful, bold, inventive, and unique work that I legitimately think stands as one of the best pieces of interactive fiction, and honestly, one of the best pieces of cyberpunk media that I have ever consumed. And I think everybody ought to check it out. Hey, I don't know if I've ever played a game that I've been so horrified of and fascinated by in equal measure. Nothing that I have ever played before is like Immortality. Also, I need to get this out of the way now before I talk about Immortality. It is undoubtedly a mature game, and not in the way that most mature games are mature. It isn't all guts and blood and the occasional swear. Immortality tackles adult content and adult themes, and it does so unflinchingly. And to its credit, 
It also does it well, and it treats everything it tackles with the appropriate weight and immensity that those things deserve. Basically, read the content warning before getting into this game, and know what you're getting into. Immortality deals with a lot of dark stuff. Also, another warning. There is boobas and, and willies and butts and all kinds of stuff all over the place in Immortality. Hence why I'm just showing you the trailer on repeat, because otherwise, there's basically nothing else I can show you from my playthrough of this game. Like, there is a whole bunch of sex in Immortality. It's not gratuitous, mind you, but you know, it happens and they do not shy away from it. Anyway, Immortality is a new FMV game from Sam Barlow Studio, Half Mermaid Productions. Sam Barlow is most known for probably Her Story, a game that I really enjoyed, as well as a really, really good, weird-as-hell Silent Hill game for the Wii. Basically, Sam Barlow is one of the most prominent dudes in all of games to actually be, like, good at writing, and, and Immortality is written impeccably well. Without getting too spoilery, Immortality is in a weird, fascinating way a sort of detective game. You're tasked with discovering what happened to Marissa Marcel, a budding film star in the late 60s who starred in three unreleased films in her multi-decade career and seemingly just disappeared off the face of the earth. You uncover the mystery via scouring through literal endless hours of footage, both from behind the scenes and the films proper. You go through clips frame by frame, fast forwarding and rewinding them, keeping your eyes peeled for connective threads to make sense of everything. You use a tool that lets you pause and search for selectable objects, basically, whether they be people or literal objects, and then you'll find another clip that somehow relates to that object. Sometimes the connections are obvious in the fact that it's the same person in another scene, or there will be multiple shots from multiple films with, say, a candle in it. Other times, the connections are less obvious, and that's when the game becomes really, really fascinating. As interesting as the framework of the game is, without the overall superb acting, especially from Marissa Miller's actress in particular, and basically others whom I literally cannot mention without spoiling the game, this game doesn't work. But it's so much more than that. The game is a fascinating piece of film as much as it is a game. It's shot beautifully with unique, artful shot composition and solid lighting and great production values. Arguably, some dodgy looking wigs and costumes aside, but for some weird reason, I kind of love the doofy-ass charm of some of the lower-budget wigs and costumes. I love some of the hokiness of it all. And the more and more you watch the footage, the more and more you uncover just how ridiculous some of the movies are, how ridiculous some of the situations are, how ridiculous just Hollywood in general is. And then, masterfully, there is a turn in immortality. The more you uncover of the footage, the more uncomfortable you get for multiple reasons the more of a voyeur you become. And arguably, the more and more complicit you become in the disturbing, unsettling events that unfold, and you're left to wonder if any of this is, is maybe your fault. That maybe you ought to stop playing, and you ought to stop looking through all this old footage, and that things are maybe left better undiscovered. But then, you're compelled to keep going. You're compelled to keep going deeper and deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole, rewinding and fast-forwarding the same clips over and over and over to dig through all of the marginalia for some, some kind of connective thread to piece everything together. And then, and then the characters comment on it, on the sheer dread that seems to be pervading the game and the films and Marissa Marcel's career, the more and more that you play the game and the deeper you get. The game itself seems to be commenting on itself, masterfully so, and it makes the whole thing that much more unsettling and fascinating and, and weird. Immortality isn't without its flaws, though. Sometimes the UI can be a little bit unwieldy, and eventually, I found myself getting to a point where I had a pretty good grasp of what was going on, but I knew that there was so much more to everything, and I couldn't quite figure out how to get to my next big revelation, which meant that I just kind of spent an hour or two clicking around and hoping for the best. Also, because of the open-ended, non-linear nature of the game's narrative, much like her story, you can basically spoil the game for yourself within the first couple of minutes if you look for the quote-unquote wrong thing. Which isn't exactly a huge criticism, but it, it's a fact. You can't deny it. At the end of the day, Immortality isn't for everybody. And it knows that. You don't have to like Immortality. And in a weird way, you maybe shouldn't. And you have to sit with that. 
You have to sit with the game. It insists constantly. It demands that you sit with it. For me, immortality became an obsession, and its story still lingers with me months later. Like, I know that a game has its grips in me when I'm furiously scrawling out notes in a physical notebook and thinking about the game even when I'm not playing it. I powered through immortality in about a week of late night multi-hour sessions, and it could have been two or three days if I didn't have to take breaks, simply because the game was exhausting, in a way that no other game is. More than liking it though, I respected the hell out of immortality. I respected it for being so audacious. I respected it for treating its subject matter with as much weight as the subject matter deserved. I respected it for being so artfully shot, so well acted, and so well written. I respected it for letting me figure it out on my own terms, and for having enough faith in me and my intelligence to simply present itself for what it was and let me come to my own conclusions. Art should challenge. Art should make you uncomfortable. It should make you question things, and immortality definitely makes you uncomfortable. It makes you question things and it most definitely challenges you. And though it isn't for everyone, I think Immortality is one of the most audacious, fascinating, and unique games of the year. Hey, Unequivocally, Elden Ring is a masterpiece. It is a 10 out of 10 game. It is easily From Software's best game, and they make pretty damn good games. Elden Ring will probably go down as one of the best games of all time, and yet, it is not my number one game of the year, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm not sorry! I'm not sorry! I'm kind of sorry? I'm mostly sorry. Okay, but let's talk about Elden Ring. Let's talk about what makes it such a masterpiece, and also, maybe a few of the niggling issues that added up for me to dethrone it as the number one game of the year. So, as you undoubtedly know at this point, Elden Ring is a Souls-like game from the inventors of the Souls series from software, filtered through multiple lenses, one lens being, okay, so what if we made Breath of the Wild, except it didn't run on a potato, and the other lens being George R.R. R. Martin. Honestly, how much influence Martin has on the game? I can't really tell. I'm not a Martin head, or whatever his fans are called. I've read, like, 50 pages of one of his books, watched a handful of seasons of Game of Thrones with varying levels of enjoyment, and got pretty bored of House of Dragons, to be honest. So, if there's obscure references to, like, Bastard Finger, the Obsidian Dagger in Elden Ring, those are going to go way, way over my head. That said, you can definitely tell it's a George R.R. R. Martin pen game, though, in all the weird, incestuous relationships between the gods and the demigods and the almost humans or whatever else makes up the Elden Ring cast. Oh, and... The Loathsome Gun Eater! That's, that's old Georgie boy through and through. The actual story itself, though, beat for beat, it is very from software. It's got the lore dumps in items. It's got the world ending and the player character being the only person that can save the world. That's not bad at all. I'm not saying it is, it's just... It's a From Software game in that way. That said, though, Elden Ring is beautifully crafted in every conceivable way. Let's start with Elden Ring's world. The world of the Lands Between is literally breathtaking. Once you come out of the tutorial cave that I, admittedly, the first time I played, completely skipped over, and come out into the world proper, a la basically every open world game you can possibly think of, you are left with your jaw firmly slacked at how much there is to take in. There's this giant-ass tree, there's a giant-ass castle, there's some weird dude riding a horse, and then you wander up to him, and his name is the Tree Sentinel, and oh god, he just absolutely housed you and wrecked your proverbial sh**. But here's the thing. Unlike previous From Software games, because Elden Ring is open world, you can just run away. You can go wherever you want. And when you do go wherever you want, you quickly discover underground caves and like weird dungeons, and then you discover a whole underground city and two underground cities. And the more and more you play the game, the more and more you come to realize just how staggeringly, mind-blowingly dense the world of the land betweens is. 
Though, of course, with a game the size of Elden Ring, you're going to get repeat dungeons and repeat enemy encounters, partially, you know, as a really effective motif. I will say, it is incredible that even after well over 50 hours, even 100 hours into the game, and well into the new game plus, I was stumbling onto new things and proclaiming, yo, what the hell is that thing? Or, I'd be watching somebody stream or a YouTube video, and I'd see something that I had never seen before, and I would boot up the game and rush to excitedly find that area on the map, and then promptly get pummeled to death over and over and over again. Smartly, Elden Ring doesn't funnel you into a linear sense of progress that can get ground to a halt because of your inability to quote-unquote get good. Elden Ring also very smartly gives you a horse. A horse that is fast as hell and can double jump, which makes panicking and running away from things a legit, viable strategy. And it also means that you're not going to get so frustrated that you simply uninstall the game and never touch it again due to some really cheap bull****. <laughs> Seriously, simply leaving an area and coming back to it later, it's not only a viable strategy in Elden Ring, but like, it is actively encouraged. And for that, Elden Ring is so much more approachable than any other From Software game before it. And it's not just in the open world design and panicked running away strategies that Elden Ring is approachable. The game emphasizes and arguably overpowers magic, especially in the early game, more so than any other From Software game. And it has such a unique, interesting plethora of weapon arts that have been enhanced from Dark Souls 3, now called Ashes of War. And it makes the combat way more engaging, unique, and fun than honestly it's ever been in a From game. Seriously, nearly any build you can think of is viable for so much of the game, which makes for fun, engaging exploration of all the tools at your disposal. And that means it's fascinating and infinitely rewarding not only to tinker with weapons and builds, but to explore the world to find more weapons, ashes of war, and upgrade materials. Big ol' tanky meat sacks are a totally viable build again. Nimble little glass cannon weirdos who do like a bajillion points of damage but die in a single hit? Totally viable. Assassin builds, viable. Poison builds, viable. Builds in which you only use companions, viable. Basically, any build you can think of has a pretty good chance of being viable for the majority of the game. And luckily, for the most part, crafting materials are in enough abundance that you can experiment, and really, if you want, grinding is easy enough that you can also respec and overpower yourself to your heart's content. I consider myself a From Software fan, but I've never really found myself overly compelled to go hard on their games. I may poke around in New Game Plus here and there, but with Elden Ring, I found myself fascinated by just how many options were at my disposal. And I found myself having a lot of fun after the game's credits rolled, just messing around in its fascinating, beautiful, bleak world with brand new builds. Keeping on that approachability tip, Elden Ring is also the first From Software game to feature companions outside of actual instanced boss fights. And there is, a proverbial buttload of them. Are all of them good? No, absolutely not. Are some of them so borderline broken that they basically might as well be a cheat code? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. But when you're fighting the Godskin duo for like the 15th time, you don't really care about how broken your companions are. Half of the allure of From Software games is how they can be so infuriatingly hard. And I think a valid criticism of some of their previous games was the fact that sometimes they got a little bit too infuriating for their own good. So anything, again, to actually help make the game more approachable, to me at least, is good. And not to mention, the companions are completely optional. You don't have to engage with them at all to enjoy the game. And that's what I think Elden Ring's crowning achievement is. It is approachable. It is open. Not only in its world design, but in nearly every other way too in its combat flexibility, in its combat options, in its actual combat encounters themselves. Elden Ring gives players near limitless freedom to explore the lands between at their own pace and in their own way. But I do have some problems with Elden Ring, so give me a few minutes to just rant about those as well. First and foremost, I think the mid to late game of Elden Ring, at least on your first playthrough, is a little bit uneven. Unless you're completely optimizing your playthrough of the game, which I think completely sucks the fun out of it your first go around, I feel like you're railroaded into a very specific path for success. At some point that I couldn't quite discern, enemies seem to just start absolutely obliterating me in only a handful of hits, 
regardless of how much health I had and what kind of armor I wore. Nearly every single enemy that I was facing, and it wasn't like I was going to places where I was wildly underleveled either. I was like 70 hours into the game, I had done a good amount of grinding, and I was simply getting obliterated anywhere that I went. And it kept happening even after I grinded for health for absolutely hours. So, upon looking things up, I soon discovered that I was basically being forced into a very specific build to power my way through the endgame. And as much as I was still enjoying playing the game, it felt like all the freedom of choice that I was gorging myself upon in the early to mid game was... it was kind of being taken away from me. Also, Elden Ring undoubtedly has some of the most incredible boss encounters that I have ever seen in a From Software game, but it also, I think simply because of the sheer number of bosses and boss-like encounters in it, probably has some of the most forgettable bosses as well. At least in your first playthrough, the quote-unquote hard bosses, for me at least, they started to unfortunately veer too much into cheap one-shot tactics rather than feeling like I was being bested by an opponent whose intricate dance that I hadn't quite figured out yet. I also hate, hate, hate ginormous bosses in From Software games, simply because the camera controls in all of their games are too wonky for those boss fights to be enjoyable. And luckily enough, Elden Ring gets around this problem, for the most part, by having A, mostly huge combat arenas appropriate for the size of the boss, and B, the ability to just simply run away. Still though, occasionally you would get into a room where a boss was simply too big and the camera was simply too fiddly, and it would end in a cheap death, and that sucked. Do I still love and obsess over Elden Ring, though? Absolutely, yes. In spite of the stumbles towards the end of my first hundred hours with the game, I came away from it in pure awe. I was fascinated and exhilarated and eager to explore and experiment with the enticing game world even more. Again, Elden Ring is a masterpiece. It is one of the greatest games ever made, no doubt. It redefines everything that is possible, not only in open world games, but in games that want to be challenging, and just in From Software games in general. If for some reason you are listening to this list and you have not played this game, which I highly doubt, go play Elden Ring. Be amazed by it. All of that praise for Elden Ring, and yet, Ollie Ollie World is my number one game of the year. Why? Because it has maybe the best vibes of any game that I have ever experienced. Ever. There is something tranquil and humbling and earnest and beautiful about this side-scrolling skateboarding game that I absolutely adore. And because of that, Ollie Ollie World is my favorite game of the year. For those who aren't familiar with the Ollie Ollie series, this trilogy of endless side-scrolling skateboarding games controls similarly to Skate, where you flick your left and right sticks to control your character and their tricks. The series also has goals, a scoring system, and a sense of momentum more akin to, say, the Tony Hawk games, whilst also having an entirely unique sensibility, feel, and vibe all their own. It's hard to explain, really, and I, I hope I've done it justice, but just know that this series has always been unique while it's proudly wearing its influences on its tattered sleeve. And Ollie Ollie World way more so than the previous two games, with a generous helping of good old-fashioned heart being proudly worn on that sleeve too. Ollie Ollie World is the third game in the series, a big boy blowout game that smartly expands upon the solid bases of Ollie Ollie 1 and 2, whilst doing away with the stuff that, for me at least, didn't really work. I played both Ollie Ollie and Ollie Ollie 2, and I liked them, but I fell off of them pretty quickly. Meanwhile, I stuck with Ollie Ollie World because, like Elden Ring honestly, Ollie Ollie World opted for making an approachable game. The first two games in the series required pixel-perfect, split-second timing to really master the games, and in turn, to basically progress. Meanwhile, Ollie Ollie World has opened up the timing window on the trick system just enough to make it easy to pick up and play whilst also having enough nuance and depth that it is indeed very much that type of game that is also tough to master. Much like Neon White, because Ollie Ollie World is so fast and so quick to reload, you're incentivized to keep restarting, to keep aiming for your best, and to keep trying to get all the ridiculous goals in a level without feeling like you need to best every insurmountable odd to simply progress whatsoever. 
The game allows you to take it at your own pace, and what I love so much about it is how rapidly you can improve if you start to actually challenge yourself to stick with a level and achieve all of its goals. Again, much like Neon White, this game is all about that flow state, where you're just somehow feeling everything out without even a second thought, and it all just moves and looks so effortlessly rad. Undoubtedly, Oli Oli World has the best hand feel of a game this year. But for me, Oli Oli World is so much more than just an amazingly tight, fun skateboarding game. Oli Oli World is endearing and cute and joyous and wonderful. It celebrates skateboarding culture. It celebrates joy. It celebrates friends. It celebrates adventure. Oli Oli World has some of the most striking, unique, inventive, and, and cool art of the year. Like the dude who created Adventure Time got really into skateboarding videos from the 90s and early 2000s. And for me, what I love earnestly so much about this game is its freedom. Not just in the way that you approach progression, or even in how you choose to skateboard and how you express yourself via tricks and your lines, something that I love so much about sim-oriented skateboarding games like, say, Skate or Session or Skater XL. It's more than that. And listen, this may sound corny as hell, but whatever, deal with it. Over the last couple of years, more and more, I found myself at odds with what I thought my gender expression used to be. And it's been this whole weird process to figure out who I am. And honestly, I'm still figuring out who that is. That's kind of the beautiful mess that I am. And in its own way, Oli Oli World being so freeing, being so open for players to simply express themselves however they want through their own virtual little skateboarding avatar, it helped give me a deeper appreciation for who I am as a gender-fluid person just happy to explore and be open to whomever the f*** I end up being from minute to minute, day to day, month to month, year to year. Listen, I'm not simply a binary person who expresses himself in one specific way or with one specific look. And Oli Oli World, it embraces that, and I deeply, deeply appreciate it for that. Like, I can make a character that looks exactly like me, and I can put them in whatever clothes I want. I can give my character f***ing purple or green skin and make a weird little skateboarding goblin in a cute dress, and that's rad as hell. Sticking with clothes and cute dresses, I also may be in love with this game's whole vibe and its self-expression and its whole aesthetic, because I legitimately think that the selection of clothing is probably the best clothing on a whole in any game that I have ever seen. And I legitimately want to own practically everything that you can wear in this game. All of the clothes are just so stylish and adorable and weird and wonderful, and I love them. The soundtrack also features some amazing chilled out bangers that help set the mood that veers wildly from chilled out as hell to white knuckle tense as you try to finish all the seemingly impossible goals, and I love it. Somehow, some way, all at once, playing Ollie Ollie World, I am the most chill that I have ever been playing a video game whilst being furiously determined to be the best I can possibly be at a video game. And it is so rewarding and fun to get into that proverbial zone, to, to feel a way that I've honestly never quite felt in games before. Ollie Ollie World is a tour de force. It is a beautiful, brilliant, endearing joy of a game where you're just free to be unapologetically unwaveringly yourself, all whilst you just vibe out playing a really tight, snappy, fun as hell, challenging skateboarding game. Honestly, one of the best skateboarding games of all time. And for that, it is my favorite game of the year. So there you have it, YouTube. End of the video. End of the year and another game of the year list is done and dusted. We are done. Like I said earlier, definitive list. I am the video game expert after all. So there you go. You don't need any other lists. Um, ridiculous. I know, but that's that's how it works. I don't make the rules. Nonetheless, though. Oh, man. Number four number four, and then number nine, and then that game. That game wasn't even on the list. That game was not even on the list. What are they thinking? Ridiculous. Ridiculous. I'm so angry about it, I could write a YouTube comment about it. And you know what? You could. You could. 
listen, engagement, baby, that algorithm. Um, legit, though, actually feel free to comment. I would love to hear your comments. I would love to hear people's takes on my games of the year. I promise I am not actually an expert. These are just one person's opinions. I would love to hear yours. This is not just me, you know, yelling into the void for like seven hours and then editing it down to an hour and a half. This is this is I want to hear people's opinions about their games of the year. I want to hear people's opinions on maybe games that they skipped over that I mentioned or games that people maybe think that I skipped over because um, listen, there's only so much time in the world. You cannot play everything. I already know that there are games that I missed that I would have loved to have played but unfortunately didn't get the time to play. Uh, but yeah, I would love to hear everybody's list. What does your game of the year list look like? Please leave those comments down below. Um, and also like, comment, subscribe, all that wonderful stuff. It legitimately really does help with the algorithm. Um, and it's not just, you know, algorithm based, but it also tells me kind of, it motivates me to keep doing this type of stuff. And it tells me what I'm doing right and, and gives me feedback on what I can improve on as well. So yeah, you know, share the video around. It'd be much appreciated. Um, Y'all have been killing it for the entire year as far as uh, support goes for the channel, but especially lately, really been killing it and I very much appreciate it. I would love to do more of this type of stuff because I really, really do enjoy it. Um, and yeah, again, if you guys, you know, like, comment, subscribe and, and talk about it and give me feedback, then I will I will have a good idea of where to go with uh, the channel and where, where to go with videos and all that stuff. But also, speaking of videos, um, we'll be back with more of the regularly scheduled content sooner rather than later. Um, yeah, yeah, this was a lot of a lot of fun to make. I really enjoyed doing this stuff. Um, so hopefully you enjoyed watching it and hopefully uh, it will be a nice little reprieve from all of the just bonker stuff that goes on during the holidays. Um, speaking of, I know that for a lot of people, holidays are a little bit of a tough time, me included, to be honest. It can be a lonely time. So I hope that maybe this will this will take your mind off things for a little bit. This will give you some entertainment. This will give you maybe some games that you could go play that you haven't uh, played yet. You know, all that type of stuff. Um, yeah, do not forget, especially now, especially this time of year, do not forget that you are loved. Uh, you sincerely are. You, lit up. you sincerely are. You are sincerely loved. You're amazing. Uh, never forget that. And I will hopefully see you sooner rather than later have a safe holidays again do not forget that you are loved you're amazing and uh smooches all right Mwah.